into heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout. God be the glory for the great things he has done and is doing. To all of you, my father's children, to uh, Mother Bird and presiding elder Odom and Mrs. Odom and all of these preachers. Let's thank God for these preachers. And I thank God for them, for what they are personally to me. All of you mean so very much to me. Uh, and, and your prayers and your thoughts, uh, that, that really helps. That, I mean, it really does. Um, but we thank God for all of you. I want to share with you a few passages of scripture. I want to share with you from Job chapter 1, verse 6, and then I want to share with you a few verses from Ephesians. I thank God when the Holy Spirit puts things together, and I wrestle uh, all week on what to preach, and, and uh, driving from here to home, and home to here, and all else in between. Uh, sometimes I feel inadequate in preaching that I'm not giving enough time to uh, preparation because I'm on the road so much. Um, but I stayed behind yesterday and told Sister Sharon I got to go to work. And I, I stayed behind full of that chicken and those, those beans. My God, whoever made those baked beans and I was, I was so full of that, and then I had to spend some time with the Lord. But Job chapter 1, verse 6 says, When the children of God came together, that Satan was among them. In Ephesians chapter 6, I want to look at verse beginning at verse uh, 11. Through verses 13 says, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in, in heavenly, in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. I want to talk for a few minutes on the subject of when hell shows up in heaven. When hell shows up in, in heaven. Dear Lord, let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable before you. God, use me to preach a word to these your people. In Jesus' name, amen. In June of 2015, I was afforded the opportunity to travel with a group of students, high school students and seminarians to San Antonio, Texas for an emission immersion experience. 
And during this time, I, I, was, I was able to preach at an affluent retirement home where everyone that lived there were millionaires and billionaires. Juxtapose that, I preached to a homeless shelter at the San Antonio Mission. Billionaires, homeless. I worked alongside prisoners at the San Antonio Food Bank, one of the largest food banks in the nation. I did arts and crafts with the developmentally disabled. And I toured a shelter complex that moved people from homelessness to self-sufficiency called the House of Hope. Now this was a week where I saw the Lord. I saw his face in, I saw him in the face of the billionaires who shed tears as they listened to me preach. I saw God in the joy of the disabled in sharing their day with me and telling me all about their lives and asking all about mine. I saw God in the face of of those prisoners who were happy that they could give back to a community that before they had ravaged so severely. I saw God in the lives of the people as they were looking forward to having their own little apartment after living on the street for so long. I saw God clearly. I saw God strong in those days in San Antonio. But then one faithful evening, that Wednesday night of our, our trip, as I was tired, very tired, and San Antonio was very hot in the summer, and I was very tired, because that heat whooped me. So I was in the room, and I was watching CNN, as I always do. And just as I saw God, I saw the devil. I watched on the news that there had been another mass murder in our country. And when the news broke, I felt like many people, I dropped my head. And just like the entire nation, I felt a stabbing pain in my soul when I realized that yet another act of terror had occurred on our shores. But this hurt a little more and this felt a little different. Because this time it was inflicted upon African American Christians. And what made it so troubling to us was that it occurred in a church while the people were in prayer. A young man whose name is not worthy to be spoken drove to Charleston, South Carolina and went to the historic Mother Emanuel AME Church where a few of the members had gathered to pray. And for an hour he came to a heavenly place that was filled with love, that was filled with compassion. And during that hour, the dozen or so people were there, they talked with him and they shared testimonies with him and they prayed with him. And he was nearly overwhelmed with peace and joy and fellowship of that night. And then suddenly... He arose and pulled out a pistol and began shooting the very people who welcomed him into a heavenly experience. And as bullets pierced their bodies, their blood spilled onto the floor, a cry must have gone up to heaven from the depths of their faith. Father, forgive him because he knows not what he is doing. It was a horrible and terrifying moment amplified in its tragedy because it took place in the basement of a building that had been dedicated to the honor and glory and worship of God. Yes, 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 yes. This young man was reported angry because a segment of God's people was growing faster than he believed was permissible. So he took it upon himself to do something to inspire others like himself to act. And like a roaring lion, he went to and fro until he found Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. A two centuries old church that was a symbol of faith 
heritage and God's overwhelming ability to raise his people through embattled and scarred. He chose this church according to his confession because he wanted to start a race war. And this war would ultimately end with the destruction of people that look like you and I. But there was a unique thing that happened. Instead of people marching in the streets, instead of people burning stores, instead of people looting, instead of people fighting the police, hundreds of people came to the site and they sang hymns and they bowed down in prayer. Republicans and Democrats, Jews and Gentiles, the people of every race bowed. And when the young man was finally captured and brought to court, the whole world heard the mother of one of the victims speak words of forgiveness through her pain. She forgave him and asked God to have mercy on his soul. He had brought hell into a heavenly experience. However, he was hobbled away in chains under suicide watch. God was already moving to heal the pain in the city and the nation that only he could do. God was already moving to heal the church. And very few watched this tragedy unfolded asked why. Because the answer was already given. Instead of asking why, those who trust in the Lord are on bended knee in churches around the world, not asking why, but asking for mercy, asking for grace, asking for forgiveness for the shooter who did not know that he did more to bring a divided people together than he could have ever imagined. He meant it for evil, but God took the sting and the venom out of his poisonous act and turned it into good. That will be a testament to the nine people who lost their lives when Satan slipped quietly into a heavenly place and tried to bring in the spirit of hell. And so we should follow the example of those families and ask God's forgiveness on people like that shooter. At the same time, we should be ever vigilant and aware of the works of the devil as we work to build God's kingdom right here on earth. Now these texts show us why evil is so prevalent in the land. And while advising us what should be done when evil pops up, it's wicked and evil head. The book of Job serves as a powerful purpose in the Bible and helps explain why bad things happen to good people. A picture is painted of God and the angels in heaven enjoying peace and love. And out of nowhere, the devil pops up. He said he had been going to and fro on the earth looking for lives to destroy. He sought godly people to snatch out of the hand of God. And at this time, God asked Satan to consider Job. And he asserted that no matter what happened to him in life, Job would not stray from his faith and would never stop trusting in God. The devil said Job had no reason to be faithful because Job had reason to be faithful because God had created a heavenly ex existence for him. He had family and he had resources and he had wealth and he had health and he had position. And he said, take those things away and then he'll turn against you. All hell will break loose and Job lost his health and Job lost his wealth and 10 people died on the same day at the hands of Satan. It was a vain attempt to start a war between Job and the Lord. But how many of you know that the devil is a liar? Yeah. Job did not turn on his faith, but he said in agony, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, encouraged them to prepare themselves to withstand the works of evil that may come upon them. And so he constantly reminded them that the devil was on the prowl. He was like a roaring lion seeking opportunity to devour the saints. 
And in the early church, believers were persecuted for their faith in Christ. They were assaulted. They were killed for fun and ostracized for their belief in Jesus. And each person was encouraged to be sure in the faith and arm themselves with the power of God to withstand the evil attempts of the devil. So Paul wanted to be sure that the Ephesians knew the nature of the evil one and how easily he could plunge himself into their affairs. To ensure that they were not deceived, he reminded them that the evil one was not a flesh and blood person, but was spiritual in nature. And as such, he could influence individuals and influence powers and the very governments that operate the nation. So he constantly told them to be on guard. They were encouraged to put on the whole armor of God and then be prepared to withstand the evil one's influence. Now combine both these texts help us to see that the source of evil is Satan. Satan working through people, Satan working through philosophy, Satan working through government. He is the source of all evil. So our response is to stay vigilant and recognize the true enemy while continuing to trust in God. Whenever there is a crisis, there is a tendency to respond in fear and anger. But we must respond in ways that demonstrate our faith in the power of God. Let me share with you three quick points and be out of your way. Number one, we should not panic. When we experience loss of life or loss of property or when we witness injustices, we must remember that they are who they are in any situation. In our fear of the unknown, the greatest risk we have of losing our faith is by panicking. That's what happened to the disciples when they were aboard a ship and a storm developed. The ship rocked and turned and many on, vo on board envisioned themselves as dead men. There was no escape. The winds were too strong. They were too far away from the shore to swim. Death appeared imminent. Then somebody remembered that Jesus was on board. So they went down and they woke him up and they said, Master, in the King James Version, carest thou not that we perish? And so Jesus came on deck unmoved by the storm. He simply said, peace, be still. Our fear sees the worst that can happen. But our faith knows the best that can happen. Our fear sees the downside of the situation. But our faith sees every situation as an opportunity for the power of God to speak to whatever the storm may be and say, peace, be still. That's why we pray fervently after a tragedy because we know that our God is able to silence every storm. But not only should we not panic, but we don't need to give the devil his victory. In Charleston, the shooter announced that he wanted to start a race war. He wanted blacks to become angry and march in the streets. He wanted them to start burning and killing and looting, baiting white folk to confront them. And then you would have whites fighting against blacks. Although he succeeded in taking nine lives, we have not given the devil the victory that he sought. The people expressed forgiveness and love even as they cried and wailed in pain. The devil wants the victory in every one of our experiences. He attempts to steal our happiness and our joy by presenting situations that force us to focus on what we lost. And focusing on our losses can make our lives miserable and it will give him the victory that he desires. Instead, why not hear Paul say, forgetting those things which are behind, I press forward toward the mark. See, we need to focus on what we have now. We need to focus on the legacy shared by those that we lost and the continuation of the work that's ahead. We need to concentrate.
concentrate on what we have now. Concentrate on how God is blessing us right now. Concentrate on the goodness of God right now. Despite the hardships that we have been through, God is still good. And when we focus on what we have, we experience a mega joy because we know that God is with us and God has not abandoned us. The devil is, is victorious if he can push us to focus on what we lost instead of God's continued blessings. In tragedy, we should hang on to our faith. We should fight back for tears because we know that God is with us and he is good all the time and all the time God is good even when we're sick, even when there's pain, even in tragedy, God is still good. Well, number one, we should not panic. Number two, don't give the devil victory. Lastly, tragedy presents what I'm calling a yet moment. When Job experienced tremendous loss at the hands of Satan. In Job chapter 13, it records him saying, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. There is power in that response. The word yet described the agony, the anger, and the dismay that he felt at the moment. But despite these feelings, there was a strong determination to be faithful. In his yet moment, he found strength. In a yet moment, a widow woman was down to her last cruise of oil and meal and acted on faith and, and the barrel did not run dry. It was in a yet moment that a woman who had an issue of blood pushed her way through a crowd to touch the very hem of his garment even though the prospects of her success were very dim in a yet moment the disciples decided to continue building the kingdom despite the anger despite the fear despite the despondency they felt after the crucifixion our faith is stirred in those yet moments and gives us the inspiration to continue even on today faith helps us look beyond our present difficult situations to the time when God will work it out the church must continue to remind the new world is coming and it's a world where racial injustice and where tragedy will not exist while racism exists down here in the world that is to come color will not matter in the new world order Jews and Chinese and Japanese and Africans and all of the other races will work side by side because all racism will be gone Satan will not win though his attempts to divide us and humiliate us and kill us yet will we trust in God say yes now we must not swelter in the despair of the moment instead we must focus on God's glory and when we focus on God's glory we remember that this old world is over God has prepared for us a place for all of God's people a place that has been made perfect with his blood there is a place God is preparing and this place is called heaven it will be a place where hell won't show up because Satan will have been defeated our churches are places where we meet to pray and we meet to worship but our church buildings are not a safe haven from the devil he walks through our doors every Sunday morning he attends our Bible studies every Wednesday he stands in the line we hug him and we shower him with love in our church we are not safe from the devil in our church building we open our doors we invite him in there is a place where the devil won't show up because he'll be drowned in the lake of fire for all eternity this place is called heaven Abraham traveled all of his life looking for a place 
place a city not made with man's hands Elijah received a one way ticket to this new and eternal place where there are no more wars because there's only peace in the place called heaven there is no hatred because there's only love in the place called heaven there is no sadness because there's only gladness in the place called heaven there is no weakness for there's only strength in a place called heaven there is no death because there's only life in the place called heaven I know there's going to be a new world because I heard Jesus say I go to prepare a place for you and where I am there you may be also this place called heaven is a place on a faraway strand where we'll never grow old the new Jerusalem will have perfect streets made of gold the new Jerusalem will have perfect lighting because it will be illuminated by the glory of God in the new world there'll be no more medicine because there will be a tree in the midst and the leaves will be good for the healing of the nations I don't know about you but I want to go to this place called heaven I may be persecuted and stoned like Stephen but I want to go to a place called heaven I may be crucified upside down like Peter but I want to go to a place called heaven nothing shall separate me from the love of God so Satan can take his very best shot but I still believe in God come what may my faith is in God say yes I believe that God sent his son to save the world I believe that he died on an old rugged cross I believe that they put him down in a borrowed tomb I believe that he stayed in that tomb all Friday night all throughout Saturday all Saturday night but the joy of my faith is that I believe that early 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 on Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hands and I believe that one day my name will be called I believe that one day I'm going to meet him in the air I believe that one day I'm going to heaven so I'm saying to you greater Bethel come and go with me to my father's house come and go with me where there's joy 